as you know, uh, yesterday, Saturday, Israel was struck by a surprise attack from Hamas-controlled Gaza with Hamas terrorists uh, flying into Israel and paragliders and uh, uh, storming the border fence. Uh, and uh, to date, uh, the number of dead from yesterday has already uh, gone past 600, and it's apparent that the number is going to continue to rise steeply in the coming hours as uh, more of the victims are identified. Uh, there's also an untold number of Israelis who have been taken hostage by Hamas <clears throat> in Gaza, including children and women, and we've seen uh, uh, images of unspeakable horror uh, that the Hamas uh, barbarian Nazis are undertaking to their Jewish uh, terrorists, uh, Jewish hostages. Um, the sites that we've been uh, seeing all day um, and the uh, information that we've been amassing uh, paints a pretty bleak picture of what happened yesterday, what continues to happen today. Um, also, over 1,300, I think, uh, wounded. Uh, with uh, over 300 in critical conditions. So this is a situation, this is a catastrophe unlike anything that Israeli, Israel has ever seen. Uh, the state of soldiers who were slaughtered at uh, bases that were overrun along the Gaza border uh, is uh, was unspeakable, um, among many, many, many other things about the atrocities that we've been witnessing. Uh, from Gaza. So we're sort of seeing what uh, it means when people say long live Palestine. This is what they're responding to. And uh, rather than just talk myself today, um, I decided uh, that I was going to take advantage of the fact that Dr. David Warbeser, who many of you know is a frequent uh, a frequent guest on the Carolyn Glick Show, happens to be in Israel this week. So I'm capitalizing on David's presence here because I want to walk through uh, how he views uh what happened yesterday and uh, what's happening, what has to happen now, and, and then um, perhaps a final question about uh, the Biden administration's role uh, in, in contributing to what, what, has, what is the war that is now upon Israel. Uh, so first of all, thanks so much, uh, David, for joining me uh, from your hotel in Tel Aviv sure, to do I, this show. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you. It's a it's dark gaze, but it's still always a pleasure to be on, on with you. So this is wonderful. Well, thanks for thanks for joining me. Um, uh, we have been. If I just take a see, see it as a sort of a segue, but a way to sort of enter uh, the conversation about the IDF and what's happening on the ground uh, through a sort of a political venue. Um, the uh, reports are are out now that uh, Netanyahu's people are meeting with uh, advisors to uh, former Defense uh, Minister Benny Gantz. And uh, they're discussing uh, the possibility of uh, Gantz joining the Netanyahu government under the rubric, under the, the the headline of national unity government or national emergency government, and that the negotiations have sort of gotten bogged down because Benny Gantz's reported demand is that Netanyahu uh, only take steps that the military advises him to do. In other words, let the military command. Uh, and run on its own Israel's war and have Netanyahu just be on the sidelines. And Netanyahu, according to the reports, has has responded uh, through his advisors that uh, he doesn't believe that the IDF's war plans are aggressive enough and he, he doesn't accept them. So uh, this is a really interesting report because of um, it, it sort of brings into uh, stark relief um, the the thinking of the general staff, uh, when we're in the face of this kind of onslaught, uh, it doesn't seem to have recognized the difference between having a limited engagement with Hamas-controlled Gaza and being in a uh, war whose only end can be a decisive victory for one side or the other. Um, and I, I find this alarming. Um, and I, I'd like to just sort of use this as a way to give you an opportunity to tell me your assessment of, of the operations um, that we're seeing from the Israeli uh, uh, from the Israeli security leadership. Well, uh, at this moment, uh, you know, we don't quite know what uh, what what the Israeli political leadership has decided. The military leadership, we have uh, a bit of information coming out 
and I think you've characterized it fairly well. The bottom line is that this has been a catastrophic, you know, 1973 was a failure of a conception. This is like the famous line. And if anybody's gone and seen the movie Gold or read about the 73 war, you see what the conception is. What we're dealing now with, uh, what we're dealing with now in this war is a failure of a, a whole flock of, con of conceptions. It isn't a failure of one conception. There, there's this body of accrued ideas that the military leadership, the security establishment of Israel has um, for, fermented, brewed, uh, enclosed itself in and lives with that has come crashing down catastrophically with the cost of immense uh, human suffering and atrocity. Uh, and 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 to some extent now more than ever, I think it's very clear that the Israeli security establishment should be operating with a degree of sobriety and a degree, a degree of humility, rather than worrying at this stage of insisting upon having full control and full power, uh, uh, fr and wresting it from the democratic leadership of the country at a moment when they've just delivered the country such a such a defeat and show no sign of having reconsidered the imagery and conceptions that have clearly led to this horrible moment. This is now the single deadliest day in Israeli history. That somebody has to begin to ask who it's not time to bring people to accountability yet, but it is time to step back and display a degree of humility by those who had their hands on the steering wheel. And the, the very demands that we're hearing about the conditions for bringing in a national unity government, unfortunately, are involving at this point uh, the idea that the people who had their hand on the steering wheel should be, be empowered even more. And, I, and, I, and I'm nervous because what I keep hearing are, is a persistence not only of the people, uh, but the concepts that have failed. I mean, I'll give you a good example. I, I saw, uh, I saw one of the, the a former admiral in the Israeli military, who's uh, he's a, a fairly sober guy, but nevertheless, he was there saying, "We need to make sure the Hamas leadership at the end of this understands that it, that, that they cannot be left in a way that they're confidently standing. They must understand uh, how." deadly and damaging this was and what and they must pay a huge price and my only feeling is we're beyond deterrence they, these people have shown us that the concept of deterrent failed uh, they need to be wiped out the second thing is I don't think that's an appreciation of the defeat and the impact of that defeat on the region on the world on Israel's stature in the coming decade or two and how imperative it is strategically for Israel to spend the next week, two weeks, whatever it takes, to deliver such a stunning victory on such a broad level that leaves people reeling. And, and, and only through that reeling will the imagery that we've suffered the last 24 hours be superseded by the imagery of a tremendous Israeli victory. The pain won't go away. But people in the region will understand Israel is a very dangerous and big and powerful country then. Right now, everybody, those who make peace, those who make war, and superpowers and the world looks at Israel, they're scratching their head and they're wondering, they're wondering, are they really as strong? Are they really as solid as people thought they were? We talked about it earlier a couple of times about uh, how you know, it, it's a very strange thing that happened, which was that uh, in the Yom Kippur War 50 years ago, uh, we were caught by surprise and we had a lot of casualties. Uh, 2,600 uh, men, our best men, were killed uh, defending and saving the country from being overrun uh, in, in that war, in the three and a half weeks of that war. And they emerged with an extraordinary victory in uh, the Sinai and on the Syrian front. And yet, the story that the, the high and mighty, the bold and beautiful of Israel told themselves was that this was a tremendous failure. And the legacy of this 
war was that what we needed was not to be independent, but to be dependent, dependent on the United States. And we had to accept America's uh, strategic limitations on our freedom to action, which meant essentially that uh, we haven't defeated our enemies since. I mean, you, you can take the 1982 First Lebanon War out and say, well, we did, but then we defeated ourselves politically on that one. Um, but uh, it, it's it's uh, it's really um, a question now that we've suffered an even larger humiliation and an even greater loss uh, because the people who are being killed, the people who were killed yesterday were not only soldiers, but many, 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 many civilians, many children, um, that uh, what do they think that we're gonna we're gonna have some limited incursion and and the Hamas um, barbarians who who have who are carrying out this this monstrous uh, campaign are are gonna give us a victory? I mean, I I don't. It, it's like there there doesn't seem to be any connection. But it, it it's like a synapse. You know, there just seems to be a cutoff from what they're what they're proposing in. And what we just experienced, what we're, we're continuing to experience. I mean, we still have Hamas terrorists operating in Israel. We haven't we haven't uh, ended it yet. Yeah, I mean, the, the, if one thing is clear, is another conception is is failed, which is that if you invite a rattlesnake to your bed, you're going to get bit. And uh, the Israel has essentially known that it has invited a two rattlesnakes, the PLO and the uh, and the Hamas essentially to set up shop and live within the really within the interior of Israel. You can argue about where borders should be. This is this discussion isn't about where the borders should go, but but Gaza is in Israel. It is in the heart of Israel, as is Judea and Samaria. So whether they're in politically or or uh, border wise in Israel or not, doesn't matter. They're in Israel in terms of geographically. And they're vipers, and these vipers are deadly, and their nature is to bite and kill. And you can't tame them, and you can't wait till they strike you. And then, and, and so the conception that somehow we can devise a structure to tame the viper has failed. The second part of it that failed is that you can deter the viper. So it's in its nature to do what it does. Um. And then the last part is let the viper grow. I think a fairly senior former Israeli official told me within hours of the strike of this of the uh, of the start of the war was well one one conception that needs to go is the idea that you can let your enemy build up and then you'll teach him a lesson when he gets too out of his behavior gets too out of control. That's sort of the mowing the grass uh, conception that we used for many years that we thought, oh, well, you know, we'll just have a limited campaign against Hamas when its capabilities become too too large. But what ended up happening, and maybe you can speak to this as well, is that uh, uh, we became so deterred, apparently, by their expanding capabilities that we enabled them to continue to expand them. I mean, they were shooting off a series of missiles, apparently practicing for what they did yesterday into the sea, and Israel just let them do it. We didn't stop them. I mean, we, we didn't object. And uh, and so it, 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 this laissez-faire attitude and it w spoke of the fact that uh, the deterrence model was Hamas, oh, is not the ours. The fear of going in on the ground, the fear of doing anything serious, the fear of Look at what happened on the northern border over the last months where Hezbollah is beginning to seize territory that's demarked as part of Israel, and the Israeli military was afraid to escalate. I mean, it should be Hamas and Hezbollah that are afraid to escalate, but they're not because they've grown. And so I think the real, the mowing the lawn is the final consequence, ultimately, of the policy of letting them build up. Israel needs to stop its enemies before they get strong, not after they get strong. So that's out the way. And then, then, then it also needs to jettison the deterrent concept, which failed. Mowing the grass is kind of a form of the of the deterrent concept. That, oh, we showed them. And then Israel has to stop deluding themselves. That oh, we showed them. This goes back to the Grapes of Wrath operation in 1996 against the Syrians and Hezbollah in Lebanon. 
We've had now how many wars? 10, 15 war, mini war, all of which at the end, the IDF said, oh, you can't believe how much damage we did to them. Oh, God, they learned their lesson. Oh, my God, they will never do it again. And then again, two years later, there we are back in the same place and we do the same thing. We release the same images and we say, oh, we've destroyed 80% of their homes. They won't have a bed to sleep, et cetera, et cetera. And then two years later, we're back again there. By now, you know, no, I'm just saying by up, now, yeah. this is repetitive to the point of laziness, strategic la malpractice, really. And and it, the, the disc needs to be changed. You can't keep banging your head in the wall and not expecting to get bruised. Look, I mean, I I I guess um, the real question is now because they're saying that uh, that uh, that we're we're staging now and waiting for Israeli the IDF to uh, to kill the rest of the Hamas terrorists that are operating in Israel uh, in order to then transfer to an offensive of some kind or another. And and uh, you know there there's a question. Um, the people who caused this to happen by their own operational blindness and um, frankly uh, uh, stupidity uh, for I mean there are other terms like lunacy that also come to mind. But you know none of them are none of them are complimentary. Um, are they going to be able to uh, lead the army and and you know, because because uh, I I was on a television panel today, and 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 my sense, and and what I said there was that look, we've never actually been in a situation this dire before, and the idea that we can even talk about where we want to go for a ceasefire is is uh, just jumping above our bootstraps. We can't even think about that right now. I mean, we're still at the very beginning of the beginning of this thing, and we need to. Uh, defeat our enemy and everything that comes after that, you know, is we'll figure it out later. But I mean, the idea that we're going to start talking about negotiating with them over anything makes absolutely no sense. And and yet, and so the question is, you know, our in 1973, um, it was a much more powerful government, despite its, you know, it's sort of the rot that had already spread into the Labor Party. Golda Meir and Moshe Dayan had. Uh, you know, full backing of the media that was totally uh, supportive, um, and the IDF was was uh, disciplined and obedient to the elected leadership, and that's not necessarily the case today. But they fired uh, the generals uh, it, uh, that uh, were un incapable of operating, and I'm not sure that you know, especially with guns breathing down his throat, saying you have to obey the generals. I, I'm not sure that. We're in a position to do that. What what is well, your in assessment? Well, in seventy three, even with the strong government, Gold at one point started listening to considerably to Sharon, who was certainly not uh, to the taste of the general staff at that point. Um, so, and and it was really Sharon's crossing, and it might have been bold, and it might have been risky, and it did cost a lot of lives at the Chinese farm and so forth. It is what won the war, and the war was won. You're right, Carolyn. Um, again. The catastrophe was the way the war started. The catastrophe was not how it ended. The, the, the Israelis proved the point that they had the power to take Damascus and Cairo fairly easily. They certainly had the power to completely disarm because they had essentially encircled the Third Army. One doesn't remember that the Second Army only had a corridor of about a kilometer or two as well. In other words, two-thirds of the Egyptian army was almost completely disarmed and the Israelis could have allowed them to surrender without weaponry or equipment. And that's it. You've essentially disarmed the Egyptian army and there was nothing left between the IDF and Cairo. I mean, this was a tremendous victory. Well, that's, that's the model for now, which is this war indisputably started as a catastrophe. It has to end in a big victory. But you're right. The, uh, the military leadership, I'm not sure, is up to this. And as a result, I think it's doubly imperative that the political echelon of Israel has the power to set strategy. First of all, strategy is ultimately a question of uh, the political leadership. It's a question of leadership, vision, and it's not a military question. So at the end of the day, yeah, and then the second, there's the civilian military relations question here. The civilians are are the leaders. The civilians are employed by the people of Israel. 
They are not. They they are the boss, and uh, mid level management or even upper level management, even the XO, the executive officer or the de- deputy is deputy executive officer of an organization does not have more power than the and he can't put terms because he's not chosen by the board. Uh, the, the 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 CEO is good. so. At the end of the day, it's also a democratic thing. The uh, Israeli people have to have a government responding to their will, which is the elected government of Israel. And in this case, it's doubly important because, quite frankly, the professional military leadership, while it shows itself to be fairly capable tactically at times and certainly technologically has delivered some things, at this moment, they are devoid of strategic vision full comprehension of the larger implications of what happened. And as a result, I'm not counting on their judgment ultimately to do the right thing in terms of setting Israel up coming out of this war in a way that either stops future wars or sets up Israel to be respected uh, by by the world and even its enemies. All right. Um you know, there's another aspect to this, which, of course, is the Biden administration, which, uh, you know, on, on the face of it, President Joe Biden uh, gave a very pro-Israel statement last night when he, or yesterday morning, I guess, America time, when he said that uh, the United States stands with Israel full stop and uh, warned uh, Hezbollah and other parties that may be interested in getting into the action against the Jews uh, that they shouldn't. But on the other hand, you know, um, isn't his policy, I mean, his policy vis-a-vis Iran and, and frankly, vis-a-vis Hezbollah and Hamas, Iran's uh, proxies on Israel's borders, uh, has played a pretty pretty significant role uh, and shares a, a pretty significant share of the blame for uh, Iran's decision to uh, order Hamas and Presumably, uh, in the in the near future of Hezbollah to open this war against Israel. Yeah, what well, we talked about failed conceptions. Washington suffers numerous failed conceptions too, and this administration embodies just about all of them. And one of the things uh, that that is, uh, I, I mean, I, not to put too fine a point on this, this war is bought and paid for by Washington. The the release of funds to Iran. The release of mil- hundreds of millions of dollars to the Palestinians, to the UNICEF, to the UN organizations that funneled it into the Palestinians. This is where the money came from for this war and for the war with Hamas, uh, with Hezbollah that might might erupt any minute. This is bought for, this is paid for by international actors who should know better, uh, like like Washington. The second thing is, and again, I don't mean to put too, to to be too blunt about this. It's very easy, and it's always the case that dead Jews elicit sympathy, and the world rises to the occasion and condemns it. The problem is what happens when Jews defend themselves, and we're not at that point yet. Right now, the war is still reversing the immediate catastrophe of yesterday, and restoring. Uh, 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 sovereignty over the last inch of Israeli territory in the south. But what happens tomorrow, the next day, the day after that, when you start getting staged images or deliberately teed up imagery of babies, uh, Palestinian babies that have been killed and so forth, and then you start getting the the, the wagging finger of, of indignation coming at Israel, and then the urging restraint and so forth, when at this point, anybody who clearly is a friend of Israel will understand Israel needs to emerge from this unequivocally, decisively, stunningly, even shockingly, the victor. And that can't be done without some imagery coming out that is going to be a little disturbing. And and and, and Israel's friends have to stand by Israel at that point. That's not happened in the past and under this administration. Largely because even if Biden himself is pro-Israeli, the people under him are not. Uh, many of them are quite frankly sympathizers with the Palestinians and probably are saying quite a different tune among themselves. 
Yeah. Um, what's the name of the uh, director of intelligence at the uh, National Security Maher Council? Maher Bittar. Maher Bittar is one of them. Yeah, yeah Maher Ma Ma Bittar. Ma Bittar is one. Okay. And so he was in charge of the intelligence assessment. Well, you know, I mean, right. look, uh, Ma Maher Bittar was part of UNRWA uh, before, too. Uh, in the period in which UNRWA was used in previous conflicts as storage places for weapons, missiles, and then launching pads. So here you have a guy who either sympathized. Well, right now they're being used. Let's just put this out there. I mean, UNRWA is the funding vehicle for the United States to fund the Hamas regime. Yes. And that's but you saying it. Meyer Batar was part of UNRWA, and he was managing UNRWA at the time when they started using the schools for, for arsenals and for launching pads. So here's a man who either sympathized with that activity or couldn't see what the rest of us saw in plain sight. I mean, you didn't need to be a rocket scientist. You didn't need to be a brilliant intelligence analyst to understand they were using schools that way. It was in plain sight. So Maher Batar either didn't see it or, want, or didn't, didn't want to see it. And this is the guy you make head uh, of intelligence in the White House, a guy who either sympathizes with enemies of the West or can't see the obvious. So I saw a report yesterday that the White House is very embarrassed because it's facing a lot of questions from people like Senator Ted Cruz about uh, the fact that they just transferred another $6 billion to Iran last week. And um, I think the quote uh, was that since... Uh, Biden entered the White House in January of 2021. Uh, they've that uh, in sanctions relief or not enforcement of sanctions that enabled Iran to uh, really uh, uh, rake in <clears throat> uh, the dough from their uh, oil and gas sales to China and other and other countries. Um, that they've already gotten upwards of 140 billion dollars. So that uh, the the Biden administration has enabled this um, and. Uh, so they're embarrassed uh, from the criticism, uh, and uh, according to the report that I that I heard last night or read last night, that uh, Biden uh, was is absolutely he doesn't want to hear anything about Iran, and that uh, he will fire anybody he hears talking about Iran, and so nobody's talking about Iran in the White House right now because they're all embarrassed, um, and and I I kind of see this as an as an opportunity for Israel to. To take advantage of here, um, what would you suggest if you were advising the prime minister how to take advantage of uh, the Americans' uh, embarrassment at the open, exposed uh, destructiveness of their policy of giving Iran billions and billions of dollars, which Iran turned around and used to coordinate this war against America's chief ally in the, United, in the Middle East, Israel? Uh, and and commit the kinds of atrocities that or the very atrocities that we're seeing uh, today. Well, first of all, I would use the moment to do what Israel has to do, uh, whatever that is. What Israel has to just do it now. Ironically, I think the more the Israelis disregard the Washington factor, the more actually Washington is pro-Israeli. I think when Israel acts decisively, Americans sense this is important to the Israelis. They're standing for their principles. They believe it's worth fighting for, and that earns American respect, and it really puts a lot of political pressure on any administration to support Israel more. So I think, ironically, the more Israel tries to get Western buy-in to what it does, the less buy-in it gets, and the more it just does what it needs to do, the more buy-in it gets. So first of all, that Israel should just do. The second thing is... Uh, you know, I can't advise the Israeli government on on activities that could involve a lot of a lot of Israeli kids and 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 soldiers getting killed. Uh, but I do have to say that that this war started in Gaza, but it was run from Tehran, and it ultimately needs to end up in Tehran. And there are paths to get there, but I can I can say this: Tehran depends on Hezbollah. To control Syria. Its entire situation in the Levant is based on the survival of Hezbollah. A strategic defeat of Iran involving the destruction of Hezbollah will involve the destruction of the Syrian regime and would blow such a hole in Iran's core that it likely would 
rattle the regime to the point of destabilizing it, potentially eventually bringing it down. Uh, people who live in totalitarian societies have an incredible sense of smell, political smell, and they smell weakness. And when the Iranian regime would suffer such a, an immense defeat, you could see a 1989-type scenario. That's the sort of thinking that Israel needs to approach this with. Whether that's exactly what they do, I don't know. Certainly this administration, who's had an influence peddling operation run by Iran in the heart of its policy, in Washington's poli Iran policy making, a government structure uncovered and unveiled recently, uh, America won't buy into this. But Americans will buy into this. And that's the key here. Israel needs to do what it needs to do. It needs to achieve a stunning strategic victory, which Washington will not sign off on, green light ahead of time. And it needs American support, which it will only get if it actually does this uh, on its own and, 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 and show that this is so serious it will do it at any rate. You know, I, I've been struck, uh, I've been moved to tears, actually, by the stories of the extraordinary heroism that uh, Israeli forces have exhibited, Israeli police have exhibited, Israeli civilians have exhibited uh, since yesterday morning. Um, some of the stories are just amazing. For instance, I'll just share one of a woman in Ofakim, one of the towns, it's 30 kilometers from Gaza, and yet, you know, they were, they, the uh, Hamas terrorists managed to uh, penetrate that city and uh, carry out some extraordinary atrocities, including hostage taking and mass slaughter. And uh, this mother was in, in her house with her son, who's a cadet at officer training course, and he had his rifle at home with him for, for Shabbat and for the high holidays. And so he was on a furlough, and his mother uh, saw, she heard gunfire uh, in a in a in a in a uh, playground on the corner of their block, and she told her son he had to go out and see what was happening, and he ran out, and um, she ran out after him just because uh, she did, and. Uh, and so he and, and some other uh, soldiers who had run out of their houses with their guns went and they were shooting, I think, two out of seven of the terrorists. And then her son was wounded and um, the terrorists were getting away and he was trying to, and they disabled his rifle and he was uh, running into a building to try to seek cover. At any rate, uh, there's a whole long story about that. But the mother... Um, she just grabbed the, her car. There was no ambulance around, and nobody was answering the calls for help there or anywhere else, really, in southern Israel for a full 12 hours. And she saw that nobody was responding to the calls of distress. So she just got into her car and started transporting the wounded to the hospital on her own. And she did three uh, separate uh, trips, the last one with her wounded son, who she was able to find in a, an apartment that had been convinced that he wasn't a terrorist and allowed him and some other wounded soldiers in uh, to their home, uh, despite the danger. And so, you know, it, it, the son was an incredible hero. His colleagues were incredible heroes, the other soldiers who came out, and his mother was. And and you hear about the story, you see the pictures of Israelis standing on line for hours to donate blood. Uh, today, and the stories of the heroism of the soldiers uh, fighting Hamas is just uh, unbelievable. And uh, you know, I, I look at I look at these stories, I listen to these stories, and I think you probably can hear that I, I'm on the verge of tears just telling them. Um, and I think that you know, uh, I, just as the seventy three war was decided by our lion soldiers who were just lions. Uh, and the general staff was uh, having a nervous breakdown. That that may be the case again today. But you know, what, if looking at our 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 people and their incredible courage and devotion, and looking at the um, sort of obs uh, uh, obstructionist view of the general staff and the Americans, and seeing Netanyahu right there in the middle of it, how do you? 
how do you assess those the, these extraordinary it's the people? Same spirit that led the Jews from the ashes of the Holocaust to resurrection in only three years, from the darkest moment of Jewish history to the to the rebirth of the greatest moment of Jewish history, and perhaps a purchase for for a period of maybe still the greatest period of Jewish history to come. What it is is for the religious. The faith carries forward in the darkest of moments. For the secular, it's this deep sense of peoplehood being part of a chain that reaches back 4,000 years that, ha that, that is so embedded in your DNA and ingrained in your body that it is, it is a family. You feel like you're part of a family with, an, with a glorious and, uh, and a history that it is, it's, not, it's becoming of you to carry it forward with the with 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 a degree of selflessness and sacrifice and certainly with unwavering commitment so both secular and religious israelis carry with them a tremendous spirit you saw it in 73 you'd see it now you saw it in other wars and small even those that went well had bad situations the you see it in terrorist attacks again and again the immense spirit of the Israeli people, the Jewish people, will not be defeated, which is why we're still here after 4,000 years when every history book should have written us out. Uh, this is, you know, Paul Johnson and his history. He starts with the, well, the Jews. He starts with that, that, that uh, by all historical measures, the Jews shouldn't exist. And yet they do. And, and, and this is the case. So our army under the flag rank level is becoming of our kids, of our people. This is an army of heroes, an army of people who are lions, who will fight to the death. And that will guarantee that Israel has a bright future ahead, and it guarantees that the Israelis will emerge victorious. But the flag rank, the highest levels of the military, is unaligned now with Israeli society, unaligned with Israeli spirit, and it, it therefore doesn't buy into the, some of the determination and strength and gumption that, that, that is becoming of the Israeli people. Uh, that is, that, uh, and, and therefore, there really needs to be a shakeup at the end of this of the top levels. They need to be as good as the soldiers under them. Well, God willing, they will be. You know, I saw a, a, a clip uh, uh that was uh, making the rounds today of uh, what's happening at Dizengoff, uh Square today. And, you know, after all of the pictures that we saw of the leftist uh, Dodd haters who were blocking uh, prayer on Yom Kippur and, and, and all the rest of it, and we talked about this at length seemingly a century ago before the events of yesterday made it all seem so irrelevant. But um, today... Uh, there were like a dozen tables of uh, of of fillin, the uh, Jewish uh, prayer phylacteries uh, uh, that Jewish men uh, put on to pray, uh, just set up by uh, Chabad, and there were long lines of young men waiting online to pray, and I thought that was pretty tremendous, and I think. You're right, and we're right, and we are facing a difficult time, which is very similar and uh, connected to the events of the last year of the revolt of our elites that we've spoken about at length on this show together and uh, separately. And I think uh, here we, we're going to see, uh, I, I believe we'll see not only miracles on the battlefield, but I think that we'll see uh, the generals following uh, their men and uh, and 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 uh, we'll get through this very very difficult uh, hour of our of our history as Jews and as as the nation of Israel and as the state of Israel you know I do have to say the uh, the, the, the sense of good I I saw it myself I I went this morning to Ichilov to uh, I tried to go at about 9 30 or 10 o'clock this morning to Ichilov to donate blood I was turned away. I was turned away because they'd already had 2,000 people donate blood, uh, and they just they just couldn't take anymore. They 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 just didn't have the ability to take anymore. 
So I was turned away and told to come back maybe tomorrow or the next day. Uh, it, it, this is such an, you know, by nine in the morning. Uh, so this is such an, a, a signal of the spirit of the Israelis to do what they can to help the guys on the front, to help the guys in the south, and unfortunately, most likely the people in the north shortly. So it, it, it is, it's a, but it is also a testament to the evil and the realization that Israelis now have. Elites did not have this. Now they do, I believe, I hope. Israel's facing evil. They're not facing somebody they disagree with. They're not facing two peoples for one land. This is evil. What, what, what Hamas has done, only an evil person does. Uh, only an evil, sadistic, psychopathic organization does. Uh, and uh, it just reminds me of the Tolkien movie. And this is the warning to the West, because I believe the complacency Israel had and Israeli elites had is affecting the West more broadly. That There is no evil out there. We're okay. We won the Cold War. We're so powerful. Who would touch us? And even if they touch us, we'll show them. That's, that's the climate affecting the West. And we're seeing that fray right and left. And it just reminds me of the line from Tolkien in the, in the, in the uh, Lord of the Rings where, where the elf, Legolas, feels the evil building. He says, there's a, there's a sleepless malice that stirs and it is on the move. Israel is the front line of the West. What Israel is undergoing is a warning spell, a huge warning light for the West that this cannot go on. The West has enemies. Israel now is facing the midst in the midst of the battle against one aspect of those enemies. And they are motivated by evil, whether they are in Tehran or other places, Beijing or so forth. These are people who will do things like, like this. The West has to wake up and realize that it cannot afford anymore the complacency. It must relearn its own goodness, that it is a good force in the world, it is a force for morality, and it should have the confidence to proceed as such. And that its soldiers, for the United States too, its soldiers, its power is an instrument of good, not evil. This whole murkiness of, of morality that, that's beset the West has to go away. We have to have clarity now. I agree with you. And it, and this is one of those edifying moments that things come into focus very clearly. Uh, for many of us, it was already in focus. But for some very important people amongst us, uh, it's been blurry for far too long. Um, and uh, we'll just uh, have to end it there. And we'll resume this conversation uh, uh, in the coming days as we move forward. Uh, I thank you, David, for joining me today. And uh, you know, it's, and and by the way, I just want to tell all of you guys at home. Um, as so many of the comments on yesterday's show were that we're praying for you in Israel, and it, prayers matter; they really do. So uh, we should all be praying, and uh, that's helping. And uh, so thank you very much uh, for your support of Israel. Thank you very much for your prayers and, and keep them coming. They're important. Appreciate that. Uh, and uh, and we'll see you again in in, in a day or so uh, for more updates. Thanks again, Pleasure. David, for joining me today. I, I really appreciate your insights. Thank you.